we've shared, we are digging into the story of a runner, all right? These four weeks jumping in on the prophet Jonah and his story. And hopefully, if, you, if you've not had the chance, we want to invite you into this now. Uh, we've been doing a reading plan. And this is four short chapters. You, you could literally read this entire story in less than 10 minutes in one sitting. But we've, we've created a reading plan, and the hope is that you can engage and immerse yourself in the story to just get more familiar with what's going on and some other passages throughout Scripture that tie it all together. And so hopefully you're getting a chance to do that. Um, if you need a Bible, if you don't have a Bible, we've got some at our table back there. And so before you leave tonight, make sure you, you have one. We want you to be able to, to have a copy of God's Word. And we, we write things down because God goes to work when we engage His Word, okay? And so grab a journal, and we're going to get to it. If you look back over the last few weeks, here's what we have seen. We have seen Jonah um, be called by God to, to go to Nineveh. We then saw Jonah go 2,500 miles the opposite direction from where God was calling him to go. We've seen, we've seen God send a storm. We've seen God send a fish, all right, in order to preserve Jonah and put him back on track. And as we've seen in this last week, as Kelsey walked us through chapter 2, Jonah finally humbles himself and begins to pray and to cry out to God uh, while he's in the belly of the fish. And if you look at, at verse 7 of chapter 2, that's when it says that he had lost all hope. When he had lost all hope, that's when he turned back to God. And he finally committed himself to vows, this commitment of, okay, I'm, I'm going to get on board with what you're asking of me, God. And in verse 9 is where he says that my salvation comes from the Lord alone. And that, that's a key, key phrase because it's at that point, it's not until then that God then orders the fish to spit him out on the beach, okay? So, so all that time, all that time of prayer and confession and this, this moment of saying, okay, I've, I've had enough, I'm ready to obey, it's not until he says, you, you are, my, I've lost all hope, so I'm turning to you. You are the only one that can deliver me. You're the only one that can rescue me. And God orders the fish to spit him out on the beach. And after tonight, I can't help but think like God's like, that's what you made me do. That's what you made me do. I don't know. It just, I, I was thinking that makes no sense to me, but uh, it cracks me up. So um, if you remember, if you remember, we've kind of framed it this way to say that Jonah needed Nineveh just as much as Nineveh needed Jonah. Because again, God has called his people to communicate and represent his love for all people. That's, that was the plan for Israel, to, to tell the story of God's compassion and his love to all nations, okay? And they were, they were kind of dropping the ball on that. And when I, mean, when I say kind of, I mean totally, okay? And so Jonah represents so much more than just a person that did not want to do what God was calling him to do. He represents a people group that were choosing to not do what God had called them to do. And we framed it that way because what we're saying is you can run from God, but you cannot outrun God. You can try to run as far as you can, but you're not going to outrun him. And so we're asking ourselves this question of what are you running to? Where are you running from? Where are you running to? Who might you be running from and who might you be running to? And that God's going to get done what God wants to do. The question for us is, are we going to participate? Are we going to participate in the work that God has for us? And so at last, last week we saw simply this concept of prayer should be your first instinct, not your last resort. And if you missed that last week, grab a hold of it this week. Prayer should be your first instinct, not your last resort, okay? And so tonight, as we jump in, we're going to keep those questions kind of stirring in our hearts and our heads as we unpack this next piece of the story of Jonah. And so if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be hanging out in Jonah chapter 3, okay? I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, and we're going to jump into it, all right? Pick it up in verse 1. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message of judgment I've given you. I think we should stop right there. I think sometimes we can skip ahead and we're going to miss some stuff if we do. And so I want to stop right there and help us grab a hold of some stuff. Because in the first two verses, let me read these again. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message of judgment I have given you. That sounds like we're just looking at, oh, okay, this is just setting up the rest of the chapter. But I think it's so much more because it's reminding us that God is gracious. That God is gracious. 
Because it says, then God spoke to Jonah a second time. So God is still a God of second chances. And we have plenty of seasons in our life where we are not so convinced of that. And this is saying that God is still gracious and God is still a God of second chances. So if we can grab a hold of this, that when we know the source of our salvation, when we can know the source of our salvation, God can work with us, God can work through us, and God can work in us. But only when we know the source of our salvation. And my mind wants to go to like, did anybody see him like get spit up on the beach? Like, I, did anybody else think that? Like, I'm like, that's so gross. Like, I'm just trying to be like on the beach. Don't we all want to be on the beach? I don't want to be on beach. Yeah, beaches are good though. Like I'm just thinking before we get on a tangent. Like like this guy, he spent three days and three nights in a fish. That's disgusting. Okay, and this this fish barfs him up on the beach, and it makes me think. I'm my dog last night. Okay, like pukes all over the back porch. Why? Because that's what dogs do, right? You know what that dog did out of that? He ate it right? Nimrod. Um, <laughs> seriously though, like, ugh. but I'm just thinking like, don't miss this. This dude has spent three days and three nights in a fish. There are gastric acids in that fish. And all Bible scholars say this, like he probably came out looking pretty freaky. Okay. Like he came out, probably his skin was likely bleached that he could have been disfigured. Okay. Like he probably looked like a toxic Avenger coming out of this thing. All right. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what now? Like, do people like know what to do with that? And, and I think in the midst of all that, here's what we can know. We don't know where the fish left Jonah. We don't know what beach, right? We don't know where the fish left Jonah, but wherever it was, God was there. Like wherever that was, God was there. Where, wherever the fish left Jonah, God chose to meet him there. And so before we even get past the first two verses, we can see that God meets him there, God speaks to him there, and God commissions him again there on the beach. And God was clearly displeased, right? He's clearly displeased, and he's disciplining Jonah in this moment. But he doesn't ever desert him. He never leaves him. I mean, God controls the storm, he orders the fish, and he rescues him from the deep, but he doesn't leave him. And Jonah... Jonah begins to confess his sins, and Jonah responds with, and God responds with reminding Jonah of his calling, because Nineveh is still the plan. Nineveh has always been that plan. Jonah just chose to take some detours, and I think for us, what we can, what we can see in that is sometimes, like, we make messes, right? Anybody make messes? The rest of you are liars, okay, right? <laughs> yeah, I said that out loud, right? We make messes, and sometimes we make them worse, don't we? Like, you ever found yourself, like, Snapchatting the wrong thing? Goo. Yeah, right? Or, or maybe this, like, you choose to talk about somebody else and all of their baggage, and somebody else happens to hear you. And then next thing you know, what do you have to do? You either tell the truth or what? You lie about it. And next thing you know, you've made a mess, and that mess gets worse because you're trying to cover your tracks. I mean, that happens all, all of the time. And I think we find ourselves in our sin. But I don't think we have to stay there. I don't think we have to live there. That sometimes we get into messes and we make them worse. But we don't have to live there. God is still a God of second chances. And I'm telling you this, he will not, or he will meet you where you are and he will lead you somewhere new. God will meet you where you are and he will lead you somewhere new. He doesn't, he doesn't want to let go of you. He he doesn't want to give up on you, and he will not give up on you. He saves you. He rescues you. He delivers you. I mean, God saves people like Jonah. He saves people like the Ninevites, and he saves people like you and me. So God does not want to desert us. It's in God's nature to receive us back. And sometimes we grow up thinking that that is not who God is. And I want to be really clear because to me, this is the story of the return. This is, this is the story. And many of you, you know this, but some of you, you're young enough to, to the return and who we are that maybe this is something you've not been able to grab a hold of yet. And I just want to, I'm going to fly by this real quick. Luke 15, Jesus tells stories. Jesus tells a story about uh, a sheep that wanders off and gets lost. He tells a story about a coin that somebody misplaces and it's lost. 
And he tells a story about a son that rebels and gets lost. And in every one of the stories, what, what happens? Somebody goes looking, and when what is lost becomes found, what happens? A party starts, right? And when that party starts, what you begin to see is we take on the heart of the Father because the heart of the Father is always this. Come home to who I made you to be in the first place. Return to me. God's nature is to receive us back. God plans to make ministry out of your mistakes. He plans to make ministry out of your mistakes. I've said this probably a million times. I think that God makes good out of the messes we make. God can make good out of the messes that we make. God forgives. God restores. That is the work of redemption. And so when we allow the messes that we make to be handed over to him, he can make good out of them. He can make ministry out of them. And scripture is filled with story after story of people making messes and God making ministry out of that. No matter how familiar you are with, with the Bible, let me just give you some names and you can go back and read some of these stories. I mean, you take a look at the story of Abraham. You take a look at the story of Jacob or the story of Moses or Peter. Many of us maybe were familiar with Peter like saying, oh Jesus, I will never deny you. And what does he do? He denies him three times. Boom. But what does God do? What does Jesus do when, when he comes back from the dead? He restores Peter and he gives him opportunity to speak truth. And so all throughout scripture, we, we will see stories of God making good out of messes. And so as we frame this and keep moving forward, ask yourself again, where am I running? What am I running to? What are the things that have my heart that, that keep me moving in the direction of whatever it is? Because God is still patient, God is still gracious, and God is still pursuing, okay? So let's keep reading this story here. Let's, let's pick it up, verse three. It says, this time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. Yee. All right? It says, this time Jonah obeyed. Like this time. Because, right, last time he did not. Okay? Now, this still doesn't mean that he did that with ease. Right? The guy has just spent three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. And now he's ready to obey. Only after consequence, right? And this, this preservation, this discipline, he's ready to obey. Jonah's obedient here, but what we'll learn next week is that he's still reluctant about it. The dude still would rather the Ninevites be destroyed than saved. So he's got this posture of reluctant obedience. I mean, you ever been there? I mean, think about it for a second. Like, you ever had to obey your parents, but you know you didn't want to? This is your window to be honest again, right? Right? Like, think about it for a second. Like, back to that whole question, like, get a job, right? You don't want to, right? But you know, if I don't, there's maybe consequences. I think about this sometimes, like, when my kids are bickering with one another, and Ezra, my son, he's not so much into the whole, like, hugging scene, and Kala, uh, my middle, she just, oh, she wants to hug. And so when, when they've had like this moment of tension, sometimes it's because she wanted a hug that he was not ready to give, okay? And she's like, bring it in, bring it in. And he's like, no, okay? And sometimes I am always tempted to get like a big t-shirt and put them both in it so that they have to like be together. Um, but whenever it's time to make up, I'm always like, guys, you need to, you need to hug this thing out. And Ezra will often say this phrase, Dad, because he doesn't call me Dad anymore. That's a whole other sermon. That I'm trying to, um, and he'll say this. He's like, Dad, uh, I'm going to obey you, but I want you to know I don't want to. <laughs> and I'm like, and I can live with that, right? <laughs> like, I can live with that. Right now, your best decision is to hug your sister because what she wants is to be back okay with you, right? I mean, we find ourselves there where we're, we're obeying, but it's not because we really want to. And so let's remind ourselves about why Jonah is not pumped about going to Nineveh. Yes, he hates the Assyrians. He hates the Ninevites. And these guys, these are the people that skinned people alive. These are the people that would cut off heads by the thousands and pile up skulls 
at city gates just to remind people of their power, right? These are the people that would impale people out in the desert and let them roast in the desert heat. These are the people that would slaughter babies and children simply because they did not want to have to care for them, okay? So these aren't just anybody's, all right? These are people bent on evil. And so Jonah's not pumped, even if the message is destruction and judgment. He's not pumped to go hang out with them. And what's striking about this is that God still loves them. God still loves Jonah. God still loves Israel in their disobedience. God still loves the Ninevites who are far from his heart. God still shows mercy to merciless people. We should take comfort in that. We should take comfort in that. But this probably took him like a month to get to Nineveh. He had plenty of time to think about it, plenty of time to reflect, all right? And the story probably preceded him. Because if somebody gets spit up on the beach, that story is going to travel fast, even when Twitter does not exist, all right? This is going to make it to Nineveh. And again, he probably looks so like, freaky that the story is making its way. And again, Nineveh is big. This is a great city. It's a, it's the, the reason why it's talking about that is because it is one of the largest, if not the largest, city of ancient times. And so the whole metropolitan area, it's not just great in power and great in population. It's great in area. It's, a, it's like the surrounding suburbs. And that's why it takes him like three days. And he's going around repeating, repeatedly telling them, it's the final countdown. It's like, I just imagine like with a boombox, like blasting Europe, um, that song on repeat, telling them like, dude, the clock is ticking, destruction is coming. And God gives them 40 days. He gives them 40 days to repent and to turn to him. That's a hard message to give. Like, like it's a hard message to give, but it's also a hard message to receive. It's a hard message to give and a hard message to receive. And sometimes... Sometimes, here's what we can learn from this. Sometimes what God calls us to, it's hard. And now, don't hear me wrong on this. I'm not saying, oh, God's calling me to go tell somebody, dude, you got 40 days. You got 40 days. You better pull yourself together, okay? Don't do that, all right? That is not what God is calling you to, all right? So if you do that, God help you, okay? Um, He's not calling us to do that, but... Ask yourself, what are the hard questions that you know you need to have that you aren't having? Ask yourself, what are the hard conversations? What is the hard message that you know it's hard to say and it's hard to hear and it's so much easier to not have it than to deal with the moment that God has called you to? Ask yourself, what is that? Maybe it's what you've been running from. Because maybe... Maybe the thought of saying these words, it's not just hard for them to hear, and it's not just hard for you to say, it's hard for you to hear. What is that? We, I mean, we all have our Ninevehs. So who's your Nineveh? Where's your Nineveh? I mean, some of us, like, our minds can quickly go to people that have wronged us, people that have hurt us, people that used to be friends, people that are no longer friends people that we trusted, right? And we don't want to see them doing well. We would rather see them suffer. I mean, that's sometimes, oftentimes, our instinct. So ask yourself, what are the hard conversations that God has put on my heart to have that I'm running from? Who, who might my Nineveh be? Obedience is one step at a time. And so ask yourself, Where in my life is obedience the hardest? Where is it the hardest? I mean, for believers, uh, my mind goes to a passage that I refer to often, and it's in Colossians. In Colossians 2, and I, I, I come back to this all the time. This is where Paul is again. He's writing to the church, and he says this in chapter 2, Colossians, verse 6 and 7. He says, and now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to live in obedience to him. Let your roots grow down into him and draw up nourishment from him. So you will grow in faith, strong and vigorous in the truth you were taught. Yet you let your lives overflow with thanksgiving for all he has 
done. When our roots are in the right dirt, we can draw up nourishment from Him and we can live in obedience to Him. We don't just know how to live, we know what to live and why to live, and it should look like faithfulness. And when we grow strong, when we grow vigorous, it becomes faithful obedience. We're called to that. So let's keep reading. Verse 5, pick it up there. It says, The people of Nineveh believed God's message. And from the greatest to the least, they decided to go without food and wear sackcloth to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in sackcloth and sat on a heap of ashes. Sounds hot. Then the king, kind of like it is in here right now, huh? Anybody else warm? As warm as Rickmer's shirt right there? Whoa. Tangent. Okay. It says, Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals, may eat or drink anything at all. Everyone is required to wear sackcloth and pray earnestly to God. Everyone must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will have pity on us and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. They believed and they repented. They believed and they repented. They demonstrated their belief. They demonstrated their repentance. And when we read it, it's like eight words. These, these eight words that says 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. In the Hebrew, it's only five words, okay? Bottom line, grab a hold of this. Obedience in our life leads to repentance in the lives of others. Obedience in our lives will lead to repentance in the lives of others. God uses these five words, and I'm sure that there are other words around this message, but God uses these five words to stir an entire city to repentance and revival. Think about that for a second. God can use five words and bring about, stir up repentance and revival in an entire city. What words will we use? Think about that for a moment. And Jonah, Jonah's got quite a fish story, okay? I mean, I just imagine this guy coming in like, Freak show, strolling into town, looking a little bit funky, probably stinking a little bit. And he's got this fish story. like, oh, it was this big, right? Like, it was huge, right? And he's got this story to tell. And he's probably got an immediate audience just because they're like, the circus just came to town, right? And he shares this message that this is, that the clock is ticking. But it's not his appearance that brings about revival. It's God at work that brings about repentance in these people. God gave them 40 days, 40 days grace period. And they did not need all of it to turn to him. They didn't need long. They were confronted with their sin and they responded immediately. Like immediately, as, he, as soon as they hear this message, word starts spreading and they respond. And the king responds and he sends out a decree, an edict that says, everybody had better get on board. And so they're fasting and they're wearing sackcloth and he's sitting on a heap of ashes. And these are ways to show sorrow. These are ways to physically demonstrate a changed heart, a changed mind. And they're hanging their hopes on unpromised mercy. See, in the message, there's nothing that says that God will, God will relent. It's just they're hanging their hopes on perhaps he will have mercy on us, perhaps that if we show that we are sorry, if we show that we are repentant, then God will relent. Verse 9, perhaps he will have mercy. Perhaps he will have pity. Like, you can write these down, Matthew 12 and Luke 11. This is, these are the accounts where um, Jesus refers to the story of Jonah. And he is rebuking the Pharisees. He's rebuking God's people and saying, look, like, the, the Ninevites who repented, they are going to stand in judgment of you because you refuse to repent. And I'm struck by that because what it shows is if Jesus believes that their repentance was sincere, we should too. 
because sometimes our mind could just go to this, that like they just did not want destruction, right? But if Jesus believed that their repentance was sincere, then, then I think we should too. And again, the Assyrians, these were not nice, kind, compassionate, loving people. This is like, this is like the epicenter of evil, okay? There's all kinds of horrible things unfolding in this city, in this country, in this nation. And this entire city turns to God. This is like the largest on record, like re revival in scripture recorded, okay? And they turned from their sin and they turned to his mercy. And so if we think about the definition of repentance, sometimes we hear that word a lot, like, man, I just need to repent or I need to, like, and we don't even know or we hear it in church a lot and like, they just, that guy keeps telling me to repent. This is what it means to repent. It is to change your mind. It is to change your attitude, okay? It is a change of direction. See it as a, a sense of sorrow, okay? Like, have you ever been caught? Nobody? Nobody's ever been caught, right? Okay, you guys, right? Like, think of it this way. There's a difference between being sorry you got caught and sorry you were wrong. And that difference is called repentance, when we're sorry we're caught, it's because we just don't want the consequences. When we're sorry it's wrong, we're facing the consequences. And we're praying for grace and mercy. And they repented. They were sorry for their wrong. They weren't just sorry, they were caught. So something I think we can learn. Repentance leads to revival. Repentance leads to revival. So where do you long to see revival? Like, do you, have, do, do you have people on your heart that you would love to see be brought back from the dead, to be brought into right relationship with God? Is it, is it our city, our community? Is it your campus? Is it your family? And think about that for a moment. What, what would life look like if all around you was revival because you lived obediently and that led to people seeing the fruit in your life, and it brought them to repentance. Here's the next question. Do you see the need for repentance with urgency? Do you see the need for repentance with urgency? They had 40 days, and it didn't take them 40 days. As soon as they heard the message, they, they turned to God. So we've got to first look at our own lives before we start bringing attention to everyone else's. Like, what doesn't belong here? And ask yourself, does awareness of your sin, does it lead to sackcloth or secrecy? Does awareness of your sin, does it lead to sackcloth or does it lead to secrecy? And what I mean by that is this, does it lead to an awareness of sorrow that who we are is not what we can fix. And we've got to wrestle with that because I think secret sin keeps us sick. A posture of repentance allows us to see God's mercy for what it actually is. And um, we talk about this often, the definitions of grace and mercy. We know they're good things. We just don't always know how to apply them. And, and let me just give you the quick definition. Grace is getting what you do not deserve. Okay? Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. And that's why they hold hands. So what happens next? Let's read verse 10. It says, When God saw that they had put a stop to their evil ways, he had mercy on them and didn't carry out the destruction he had threatened. Let me read that one more time. When God saw that they had put a stop to their evil ways, he had mercy on them and didn't carry out the destruction he had threatened. Mercy happens next. Mercy happens next. And some, some will maybe translate that, and depending on what kind of Bible translation you have right now, some, it will translate that, that God repented. And, and I want to be clear here, the better translation is God relented. Okay? And the best way I can explain is this. Some, uh, uh, my brother and I, um, when we were kids, I don't know how old it was. I was maybe um, eight or ten and maybe younger than that. And we, I don't even remember what we were doing, 
but it was not good, okay? And my, my mom and dad, like my dad, I have no memory of my dad ever spanking us kids. My dad is a very large man with very large hands. I don't know what happened to me. And um, like, I have no memory of him ever spanking us, though I have plenty of memories, memories of deserving it, okay? Dad, I don't think he, he, would, he would never discipline us in that way, I think because he did not want to hurt us by accident. But dad was the guy that would lecture us so much to the point where it was just like, oh, just beat me already, <laughs> right? Like, and it was just like, you get to the point where you're, like, you're mentally checking out and you're just like, he asked that question, do you do this because you don't love me? And because you're not paying attention, you're like, yes. And it's like, what? You know, and you go back to it. My mom, totally different story. She had no problem spanking us, okay? Well, we had made this really poor decision. I don't know what it was. I just remember what happened next. She sent us to our room and said, you better get to your room. I will be down there soon, okay? Translation, you got 40 days, okay? <laughs> Do you see where I'm going with this? Get to your room. I will be there soon. Dad's not home yet, okay? My brother and I, suddenly we have this sense of sorrow in our hearts. We don't have sackcloth at our disposal, but we got a whole bunch of underwear, okay? And here's what we did. We put on every pair of underwear we had because <laughs> I knew swats were coming, okay? And my mind was like, I'm going to put on every pair of underwear I got. I, had, I couldn't well, I come out of the room. I'm like walking like this because I have like literally every pair of underwear that I owned, I had on. And I'm sorry to give you that image, but I was eight, okay? <laughs> and here's what happened. When mom saw us, she's like, starts laughing at us. And she said, when your dad gets home, you're going to have to have a talk. She relented. We did not get our swats. We still had that lecture. Here's the deal. Judgment is postponed, okay? There is a difference between repenting and relenting, all right? So God does not change his mind. He's postponing that judgment because they changed their heart. Mercy is what happened next. You can write this down and check it out later. Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10. And it just unpacks real quickly how God says that like if, if, if a nation that he intends to bless chooses to not live what he's called them to, they will not be blessed. And if a country that, that comes under his judgment chooses to change their mind and live in accordance to him, he will not destroy them. And so God is telling this story through everything. Mercy is what happens next. And if we are not genuine, when we will not see his mercy for how good it actually is. And so here's where we're going to land for tonight, and we're going to break into our groups. And I think it's the same questions that we've been asked in the last two weeks. Who is your Nineveh? Who might your Nineveh be? Who might you be running from or who might you be running to? Are you going to participate in what God is calling you to? But in the midst of all that, maybe, maybe we just need to be reminded that God is still a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances. God is a God of redemption. God is a God of forgiveness, of grace, of mercy, of restoration, of reconciliation, all of it. He's still just. He's still holy. He's still good. And he's still in love with you. And so no matter where you've been, no matter what messes you have made, God can make ministry happen through them, but he's got to restore you first. And in order to restore you, your heart has to be repentant. We cannot, we cannot live in right relationship with God if we are not willing to do as he calls. We cannot live in right relationship with God if we are not willing to do as he calls. So the question is this, what revival is waiting on you. What revival is waiting on you? Let me pray. God, we are thankful for tonight. We are thankful for the opportunity to be together and to be in your word and sing songs and make ridiculous videos and, and just be able to laugh together and be able to stand with one another and to be able to be vulnerable with one another. Father, tonight we pray that in our group time we can unpack what you're doing um, and be a part of it to participate in the work of redemption that you are calling your people to. And God, we know that if you want to do a work through us, 
we got to wrestle with the work that you have done for us. And so, God, remind us of that, root us in that, and help our hearts be ready for you to work from there. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.